This week on CrossFeed. Can you get a get-out-of-church-free card? Is execution pro-life? Churches, then and now. Always the clergy, never the bride. And elves and ghosts in Iceland. Hello, everyone. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, welcome. Interesting week, Jim. Busy. Busy. A lot going on. People in the hospital, a lot of people to visit, new people coming to visit. Uh, and then today we had a uh, our first ever annual hymn festival. And we did Irish hymns this year. Cool. So uh, it was very uh, neat. Uh, and our director of music outdid himself. And he had a woman who was a young woman who was a fiddler who accompanied our choir and um, himself. And they did a couple one pieces that she just did solo. And then there's some he, he did uh, some duets with her. And then uh, we had another pastor there who plays guitar. And so he was... Uh, also then accompanied our choir and accompanied uh, our director of music. So it was pretty, it was, it was very nice. It was just a very busy day, though. Cool. So there's, um, there's hymns out there that are uh, Irish but not Catholic? Yes. Um, actually, there's uh, a, uh, Stuart Towand and Ke- Kelly, I can't remember her last name. Um, but they do, they're evangelical and they do a lot of contemporary Christian music. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're, but they're Irish and, uh, excellent music. Um, now he's, uh, several of the pieces we've sung. And, and not only are they, 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 they very good musically, but they're very good theology, theologically. Theolo- <laughs> theologically. Thank you. Jim has his theology mixed up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you will find that it is you who are mistaken. All right. No. Well, where should we start tonight? Oh, well, I was going to say, saying I had my theology mixed up. Um, maybe I need to go to jail. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or, or you desperate. go to church. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> this was kind of fun. Yeah, all right. So this is in uh, Bay Minute, Alabama. All right. So this is, understand, this is Alabama, um, down in the south in the Bible Belt. All right. So um, nonviolent offenders have a new choice. You can go to jail or you can go to church every Sunday for a year. It's called Operation Restore Our Community. Uh, misdemeanor offenders uh, can choose to work off their sentences in jail and pay a fine, or go to church every Sunday for a year. And if they choose church, they can pick the place of worship, but they have to check in weekly with the pastor and the police department. Yeah, but if, if, if they have to listen to me or you preach, they'll probably want to go to jail for a year, you know? Probably <laughs> less painful. I think, I'll never do it again! <laughs> My church, especially if they forget to turn the sound system off when I sing, you know that'll that'll do it too. You know they'll they'll be hurting. Jail is much better. Send me back. Send me back. Well, you, we've been you talk about sound systems. You know we've been um, kind of tweaking ours and 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 trying to get it just right. And we're still yeah we've kind of got the hardware bugs worked out finally, but just sort of getting used to you know adjusting things when they need to be adjusted and whatnot and uh, there's been a couple times right at the beginning of the service where where it um all of a sudden you get oh feedback oh we'll turn it down you know or something like that and um i have to i, I haven't said anything to him yet but I, I gotta tell him all right no do that during the sermon kind of right in the middle to, so that everybody wakes up again <laughs> <laughs> so now we had a yeah anyway um <clears throat> now, i think this is kind of an interesting idea you know, I don't know what it's, you know, if, you know that, I mean, they're nonviolent, which means, you know, and, and not only do they say nonviolent, but then they say misdemeanor. Mm-hmm. So it's nothing too serious or anything. Like littering. Um, yeah, or I, I was wondering maybe writing bad checks or something like that. 
Uh, I, you know, I don't know what they can, you know, what would fall under that misdemeanor. But who knows, you know? Uh, um, although, you know, it says, uh, they will be allowed to pick it, pick the place of worship. I wonder if it has to be a Christian church. Or can it be a Jewish synagogue? Can it be a mosque? And that's so the thing. It, yeah, it would, it would have to, they would have to allow for any religion. And that's where it gets kind of sticky if you really want to push it. He's like, well, I'm part of the church of the, you know, uh, the, what was that one? The church of body piercing or something like that. You know, well, the, the church we talked about last week, uh, with, or a couple weeks ago with the, you know, the new prophet. Or maybe they are Spaghettifarians or yeah, Pastafarians. Yeah, <laughs> of course. It, it would. I guess it would have to be a church that that actually has services because some of those don't. Um, right. Oh, yeah. You have to check in with the, the the pastor. Right. Right. And the police department. So there has to be a, the pastor has to check up each week that you have been there. Right. So it, it may well be um, without actually checking out Baymanet, Alabama's uh, um, community. Um, place like that i'll bet you there's not a mosque right <laughs> i'll be true <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, but we'll no. see how what happens well it'll be interesting to see uh it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how that that turns out does does the the church attendance does the gospel really uh, affect people's lives and does it turn some of these guys around i mean i'm at the jail i mean it, i've seen it do it i've seen the gospel actually change you know some of these guys lives that they're at the jail Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe it change some of them too. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Can 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 they go to a um uh, uh universal life church service? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Universal life church. Yeah, can, yeah. Can can, can 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 they go online and get ordained and then go to their own service? There you go. Themselves at home. There you go. They'll be the pastor and the person. <laughs> And they can do wedding. Yeah, they can just talk to themselves for an hour. <laughs> All right. So, for some um, days I feel like that's what I do as it is. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, nobody is really listening. All right. Uh, so this is an uh, article that says more couples pick friends to preside at weddings. And basically uh, the gist of it is that um, more and more it's becoming the norm <coughs> that um, people who are not uh, sort of churched people are um, are just having their friends – officiate at their weddings and uh there's a uh, uh, the universal life church monastery the, um is a uh sort of an internet church uh it's not really a church because all they do uh what it really is is uh um is a, a place it's that you send in coordination it's, yeah but it's you, free you, that's they don't charge anything but i mean it's it's I don't know. I don't know how, according to them, different states will recognize this to do a wedding, and I don't understand how, really, because it's not an actual church. It has no structure. It has no beliefs. You just, you know, I, I thought about before, the, I really thought about today before we got, we, we, we started, of you know, just applying for my dog to have an ordination there, you know, online. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, you know, my dog could do weddings then, according to them. Uh, or baptisms. They said they could do baptisms too. Um, but, uh, you know, um, so it's, uh, you know, <laughs> Josh is over here like, yeah, yeah, I can just see Sophie now doing a baptism, licking the person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Slobbering all over. Anyhow. Um, so it's just, okay, um, I mean, apart from that, um, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with this. Massachusetts is interesting enough, by the way. I looked on this thing and talked about Massachusetts and ordination laws. Massachusetts, all you do is pay twenty five bucks and you get a license. Anybody can get over to age twenty one get a license to do a wedding. Yeah, it's only well, good for that service that day. And you know, and, and the, the, that's kind of the gist of what we're talking about. Um, you know the the I think out of, out of this whole article, there's only one actual um, sort of fact uh, information, um, and that is that uh, in 2010, 31 percent of users of the not.com and the wedding channel.com 
um, used a family member or friend as the officiant up from 29%, which in, in 2009, so it went up 2%. It's, right. I mean, that, that's not much. I don't even know if that's statistically significant depending on how many people they have using it. Well, I mean, it, the other problem is, is, um, is this a scientific survey or is this people who go on to the wedding channel dot com or the not dot com and, you know, it's a, right. you know, who, who did your wedding, you know, poll and which would be very unscientific. Right. Uh, I mean, especially since the people that use those websites are, are not as likely going to be using a church to begin with. Um, just because a lot of churches, there's not really a lot of planning involved. I mean, there's there's a few details as far as flowers and whatnot, but and and um, but as far as a lot of it is sort of already determined by the traditions at that church. Well, I I, yeah, I haven't I didn't look at either website. That's saying, please don't tell me there's not a lot of planning on a wedding because we've been Josh will shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 no! I, I understand that there is a ton of work on a wedding. Oh, I I uh, remember. You know, I've been there, done that. Right. Um, yeah. And and I got married in church and all, but but at the same time, as far as you know, using one of these, um, you know, websites or whatever versus just sort of sitting down. I when I got married, there was no internet, you know, so I never even considered the idea. Of, uh, even oh, now, I got I, married. We were using bear skins and you know stone knives still, you know. So <laughs> I have my pet dinosaur at the wedding, but anyway, uh, it's a sixty-one percent. Um, uh, but still, I mean, even if it's use, you know, uh, even if a lot of even a lot of people use it, it's which people want to take the poll. I mean, if it's if it's if it's that type of thing, and let's not it's, it's scientific data, then you know, it, it is self-selective. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there's there are a number of people who uh, uh, do that. I'm, I don't have a problem with it. And actually, I would prefer it because um, it's talking about it. This shows that you know how more people are getting away from organized religion. But seriously, if your only relationship with church is to be, as they used to say, hatched, matched, and dispatched. Um, you know, baptism, marriage, death. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but I don't want to, I don't want to sit down and do this wedding for this couple who are, I guess, you know, members of the church, but, you know, planning on getting married and I'll never see them again. Right. I mean, you know, I'd rather them go talk to their friend George and have him do it. Mm-hmm. They'll actually have a relationship with him. Right. Uh, I had a friend of mine now, um, and his church was about two blocks away from a, uh, a place where they had a lot of wedding receptions. And so a lot of people would come knock on his door about weddings because he was just, you know, I mean, not even two blocks. I think about two blocks away. It was just, you know, I mean, everybody could park there, walk down to the reception. It was just, you know, too perfect. And uh, so he set the rule that he would marry you if you're not a member couple, provided that you not only went through the um, his his uh, pre-marriage counseling, but also his adult information class. You yeah. were not required to join the church, but you. He said, "I have the opportunity then for ten weeks." Two hours of class to share the gospel, and he did have four, or three or four couples a year joining his congregation through that. Not every couple who went through the pastor's class did, but several couples who did wound up joining this congregation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if somebody's not really sincere about this, if they're just looking, I just want you to do my wedding and never see you again. I'd rather have George do it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've, you know, I, I've been to secular weddings. Um, they, I, I don't like them, but I mean, that's probably not a big surprise. <laughs> At the same time, there's something to be said for, um, being sincere about who you are and, and not sort of putting on this religious show, you mm-hmm. know? So, you know, what the details of a wedding, are really about um, what the um, bride's mother wants um, more than anything else. <laughs> I wouldn't say that was true of our wedding, but often it is the case. Uh, what she didn't get that she wanted. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I, I've I've also 
talked to a lot of pastors and, and heard him say, um, I would, I'd rather do funerals than weddings. Um, That's because cause they're stupid. <laughs> well, they say, because, uh, funerals focus, um, you know, people are, uh, are, are there, they need to, they're looking for comfort and, you know, they're, they're looking to hear the gospel. Um, and whereas, uh, in a wedding, um, uh, it's really focused on the bride, um, the couple at best, but there's very little focus on Jesus. Um, yeah, I've heard that too, but maybe it's going through my, my parents' funerals and my brothers and, uh, I, I hate doing funerals. I start, I break down and cry. I hate seeing the pain. I hate seeing the turmoil. I hate seeing the hurt in people's lives. I hate the fact that you, you know, some situations you get a young father and he's a wife and young kids. Um, I know I, 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 I've come to the thing. I'd much rather do the wedding. They're much more joyous occasions. Well, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I, I think that, that attitude, while I understand it, um, is, is almost a little opportunistic. Um, and, and frankly, in my experience, um, it's also a little bit, uh, idealistic to say that, um, in a funeral, people are looking to hear the gospel because <laughs> I've had plenty of experiences with funerals where people have all kinds of requests that have absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. Or they'll say, well, why didn't you talk about him? Yeah, why didn't you say more things about the guy? Right, right. Yeah, what a great guy. What a great guy Jack was. You know, mm-hmm. and they're not, you know, they're not really focused. And you, you don't talk about, you know, what a successful person he was and, and how he was, you know. Well, I do try to tie those things in, but, um, but you know, they, they some people get really upset that you, that's not all you talked about. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... Yep. But anyway, so uh, you know, uh, I you know, I I did ask my son if he wanted me to get the dog ordained and have the dog do his wedding next Saturday, but he st- he'd still rather have me do it. Wow! Yeah, boy, that's impressive. Yeah, <laughs> he chose you over the dog. Yeah, he chose me over the dog, man. Who can who, who can bet that? I, oh. you know, wow. Hey, maybe I should have. You know, I'm not sure my wa- daughter would have, but uh, the dog, but the, but uh, you know, <laughs> he's a, so, you know, did he say they're like, well, can I get the dog to do the sermon? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's probably uh, would have been a better one anyway. Um, <laughs> well, I talked about uh, the fact that uh, there people are uh, um, kind of walking away from organized religion, uh, which. Hey, you know what? The last ten years have been tough on churches. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh-huh. So, um, last ten years have been tough on everybody, uh, from a financial standpoint. Um, but we've got a uh, Hartford Institute for Religion Research uh, did a study, uh, and a report titled "A Decade of Change in American Congregations, 2000 to 2010." And um, since when do decades have eleven years in them? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, so forty-seven percent of congregations said that their worship experience was innovative and contemporary. Um, reported high spiritual vitality versus seventeen percent that said their congregations were neither innovative nor contemporary. What's high spiritual vitality? I don't know yet, Pinky. I don't know. Um, well, uh, there was that book that was published by um, Willow Creek um, that reported on some surveying that they did in their church and how people grew in their faith and everything. But well, uh, you know, there's a that's actually Willow Creek's been kind of interesting what they went through um, because. They, they're the ones that really sort of pioneered the seeker service and, um, where they, it was sort of like real watered down and, and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and what they, they, and then they, they published a, a, you know, information on how to do that and all that. And then they published another thing, uh, a few years later that basically apologized for that and said, don't do it. It doesn't work. Right. And well, it gets a lot of people, but it's, but they don't grow. 
Right. You know, they, they don't grow in their faith. And, um, that's, that's the problem. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know how you, you know, I'm not sure how they even, um, uh, uh, um, how do you quantify innovative and contemporary? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, what is what is innovative? What is contemporary? I don't even know what those words mean. You know, in, in terms of well, a church, right? Because you know, like if if we do, uh, you know, something like "Lord, I lift Your name on high," you know, people around here call that contemporary. That's not contemporary. It's like fifty years old. You know, <laughs> it's older than me. <laughs> It's, I don't think it's fifty years old, but it's 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 up there, pretty close. But, uh, uh, you know, but yeah. Th- so no, because it was fifty years old, be nineteen sixty. It wasn't nineteen sixty. It's like you no know, more like the nineties. Um, okay. Well, but, but okay, anyway, whatever. Yeah, I mean, but there's other songs. But the question though. is, is though, what, what, how do you? I don't know how you how you. Probably, what might be a more accurate thing would be. Do I feel that the sermon relates to life? You know, I read some sermons from other pastors. And there's times I look at this and I go, what's this have to do with anything? You know, I mean, seriously, yeah, what the guy says is absolutely true. Don't get me wrong. But it has nothing to do with, nothing to do with my life. Mm-hmm. You know, has nothing to do with anything that I do. Um, you know, I, I you know, it has nothing to do with me going to work tomorrow. I mean, right. yeah, I guess it's like, yeah, it's true. I guess it'd be true if, you know, to stand up and read a, te- to read a, you know, the, the, the uh, periodical tables on, on, of, uh, uh, you know, the periodic, uh, table of elements too. That'd be true as well, but it has nothing to do with anything going on in my life. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think one of the questions is how real life related is some of this stuff? Life moves mm-hmm. pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You yeah. could miss it. So, and, you know, definition of, of uh, I mean, there's a, there's a vast distinction. Um, definition of contemporary. Um, or innovative. What the heck's that mean? I, does that mean that I, you know I would? It, it could mean well the service that that we're using is um, more than uh, or is is less than three hundred years old. You know, um, it, it could mean you know I like okay. I went to I was uh, doing pulpit supply at a church one time and and I get there and they said okay so you know the Chicago Folk Service right. <laughs> And I went the what? <laughs> so that was a little rough, but you know that was considered contemporary, all right. Even though this is, it was from the sixties. Right. I need, I need audio. So probably the the meat of the the survey was that congregations it says are also having hard times financially. In two thousand, thirty one percent of survey participants reported excellent financial health. In twenty ten, that number was just. Fourteen percent, right? So eh, we're in a recession, and it's affected churches the same way. Um, it says one bit of good news is that one in ten congregations reported that by the time of the survey, they had already begun to recover. Yep. Well, there's a lot of um, yeah, there's definitely several uh, churches out there that are hurting. Um, I mean, even mega churches, uh, the, the Chris Cathedral filed bankruptcy. Yep. Um. And, uh, so, you know, that, that, uh, and what was the other one I was just reading about? Uh, oh, there's the church in, uh, Kansas City, a mega church in Kansas City, where, uh, that, that was foreclosed on and had to file for bankruptcy. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, but again, yeah, but there's other factors I'd like to know. Okay. I mean, is it all just the, is it recession? I mean, how many churches were hurt because the pastor screwed up? Right. You know, or some of the, the the lavish lifestyles some of these guys live. I mean, I just I don't know. There's 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 a lot of questions I, I'd like to a little bit know a little bit more about um, because it says um, you know um, the data came 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 from surveys and represents 
uh, 11,000 congregations, 120 denominations. Uh, most often the surveys were completed by the congregation's leader. Did they really get 11,000 responses? Is that what it's saying? Could be. As long as, you know, if it's a, I, I'm willing to, um, uh, sort of respond to surveys like that, uh, if they're short. If you only have a half a dozen questions or so. I get phone calls from, a lot of times, just like Yellow Pages companies or something like that. Um, but every once in a while I get surveys like that. It's like, eh, okay, fine. Just roll, make it quick, you know? And, um, so I, I don't mind, I don't mind, you know, responding to that stuff, statistical information. Um, but what, I mean, one of the things that it mentions here is that, um, more than one in four American congregations had fewer in, fewer than 50 in worship in 2010. Um, just under half had fewer than 100. Overall, median weekend worship attendance of your typical congregation dropped from 130 to 108 during the decade. All right? That's a significant drop, you know. Um, and so you have less people there. You're going to have uh, typically less money there. I mean, that's sort of the logic. It, it doesn't always follow that way um, because a lot of the people that, uh, in, in my experience at least, a lot of the people that are sort of on again, off again, uh, tend not to be the big givers. Uh, the people that are really dedicated to the work of the congregation um, tend to be the, the bigger givers mm -hmm. um, because they're giving of themselves in um, not only, you know, they, they see their uh, giving of their time and their giving of their uh, money to be tied together in, and inseparable. And um, so, so the, yeah, the people that don't see it that way that, um, you know, depart with the George Washington when they're there. <laughs> when they're not there, it doesn't have a huge impact. So, um, but it, you know, you still, if your average attendance drops by what twenty-two, um, it's gonna make a difference. So, All right. Well, okay. I, I actually looked up a little bit more on the report of the Hartford Institute of Religion, and said um, one is. Um, um, aging mainline congregations, and there's a, 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 a less growing of the evangelical church. Um, that even young adults aren't even really uh, active in a lot of evangelical churches anymore. Um, yeah, so. that goes back to um, the, there was a lot of really good information on um, on that kind of thing, especially that demographic, uh, young adults, um, in the book I mentioned, uh, in the past, Essential Church, um, they get into that a lot. And, uh, like, the first half of the book is, what's the situation and why is it like that? Uh, and then the second half is sort of what you do about it. And it's actually, like, two-thirds to one-third. Yeah. Of, so. One of the things the guy considers innovative is getting more involved in interfaith work. <laughs> Well, I don't consider that innovative. So, yeah. yeah. That, and he but, says that's a positive characteristic that, uh, you know, uh, American congregations' involvement in interfaith worship doubled and their involvement in interfaith community service nearly tripled. So, um, so uh, but then he says that uh, contemporary worship uh, was a 14% increase over the last 10 years in churches that that uh, you have services with guitars and drums. and um, So I would like to do a little bit more reading of the actual study. Well, yeah, and you know, and that's the problem with, with so many of these things, especially if you're going to use these sort of uh, vague terms like innovative, you know, whereas, uh, you know, innovative, oh, cross-Christian kind of stuff, well, that's, that's nothing new, you know. I mean, geez, the World Council of Churches and National Council of Churches have been around for how long? So, um, ecumenical movement's kind of old. <laughs> Frankly, if, if anything, yeah, I see things getting more polarized in a sense. Or, you know, you've got the, all the, with the, all these, um, uh, non-denominational churches and that you, you, you're getting more, uh, those are really polarized because they don't, um, they may have joint activities and, and things like that, but, uh, they tend to kind of keep to themselves. 
the problem is, is if you, um, especially if you're non-denominational church, uh, unless you're just sort of a generic evangelical and, and there's other generic evangelical churches in your area, um, you know, if, if you're, uh, um, uh, if, if your pastor's a Calvinist and, uh, and the, the other churches nearby are Arminians, you know, you're gonna, well, I'm not gonna have, you know, we're not gonna do a joint service with them because they you see things differently than we do and, and things like that. And, um, so, at, and other times that stuff's just ignored, which, uh, that's not innovative. That's just, pushing things under the rug so right and it's interesting i mean they 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 you know the the, the whole range of things in the sur- the survey um i mean baha'i unitarians conservative jewish um and so it's a muslim i mean they really do go and it's interesting enough the evangelical lutheran church in america is considered old line or mainline the lutheran church missouri synod he considers evangelical that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Probably um, because we hold to the Bible as the Word of God. Probably. Um, 15% of, of, no, 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 17% of LCMS churches or something says high spiritual vitality um, and uh, 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 percentage of members uh, 65 plus years old in the LCMS is just 40%. Wow, if that's true, that's huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about that. If you know, um, if if half your membership sixty five or older, uh, Presbyterian USA, he says sixty two percent. I did not know that. Well, Th- that's man. I thought we were old. <laughs> you know, uh, and United Methodist fifty percent. But I mean, that's that's that. Those are huge numbers. Okay, so so you got a list there. Who are the young churches? Um, Assembly of God, thirteen percent. Kind of figured. The Mormons, four percent. Um, Baha'is, eighteen percent. Uh, non-denominational, thirteen percent. Right, generic evangelical. Um. The Mennonites, 21%. That's interesting. Christian Reformed Church, 18%. But uh, generally, overall, the more evangelical churches tend to have younger groups overall. That's not surprising. Um, though not necessarily. I mean, uh, the uh, Reformed Church in America, which is fairly... The um, pretty main line, yeah. The old line. That there, it's 27%. Yeah. Well, uh, 65. But still, you know, uh, if you're talking the, uh, overall, it, it's kind of surprising. Some of those numbers, the percentage of people who are 65% old. Well, you know, and, and interestingly, it's, there's not a, a direct correlation with, with age, um, and, and sort of evangelical versus, um, uh, mainline or, or something like that. Because, um, in a, uh, demographic study that we did of our community, of our sort of immediate surroundings, um, uh, and this isn't our a study we did. It's a study that we were given. Um, so it was done. It's an actual demographic study, not just us banging on doors. Um, and, and that is the, the, um, the families in our area are, or the, the households in our area uh, tend to be, uh, families, um, tend to, you know, skew young and, um, and this particular type of demographic group prefers, if they attend church or if they have any interest in a church, they tend to prefer um, some of the more established, what we'd probably call old line or, or mainline um, church bodies. And um, so I was kind of surprised by that. So it was encouraging, <laughs> you know, given that I, I kind of consider. Uh, Missouri Synod to be something like that. You know, we're, we're not a, we don't have the sort of liberal theology of a lot of the other uh, churches or, or sort of, um, not necessarily liberal theology, but, uh, a wide range of theologies that, um, encompasses liberal theology or allows for it. 
um, because you, in a lot of those churches, you, you tend to get a, a broad variety, and you're not really sure what you're going to get going from church to church. And now for something completely different. So, so I, you know, I, I, churches are, are getting smaller, um, and I, I really I see this as a wake-up call um, in, in case people hadn't figured it out. All right, there's a lot more churches that are, um, you know, a lot of churches are closing. Um, looking just at Missouri Synod, we're, we're closing churches faster than we're planting them. Um, you know, it's it's discouraging. Uh, we recently had a, a church close. It was, in fact, it was a plant um, that closed right here in our community, which is very, very um, painful. Um, the pastor was a good friend of mine, and and um, you know they were doing some really, no, they were doing some innovative stuff. Um, and I mean stuff that I've never seen before, and uh, and and so it was it was really sad to see that close. Um, but at the same time, there is also a church planting movement. Uh, it's mostly among the evangelicals, but um, but there is a, you know there's groups. Uh, um, a lot of the sort of uh, churches like. Mars Hill in Seattle, um, uh, Saddleback, Willow Creek, they're creating their own sort of mini denominations by, um, creating these networks of, of church plants and, and that they're helping to coach these churches to build up. And, and so there's, there's a movement, um, of planting churches and, and kind of it's built on the idea that when you create a church or when you, when you plan a church, all right, and get it started, it's that it's, uh, they use the term born pregnant. That, um, the idea is that we're, our goal is not to build up our church to be really big. Our goal is to, um, is to be able to plant more churches. And, um, and it, it's, they use the term exponential growth. Um, that, you know, we can, we can do more, as a series of, of churches than we can as just one church because we can spread out more. Uh, we can connect with, with a bigger variety of people, um, that will, uh, different, different churches will appeal to different people and, and things like that. Um, and so, and it's, it's focusing on the, the kingdom growth as opposed to, uh, you know, we just want to boost our numbers at our particular congregation. Now, who was it? Uh, well, and then, you get places like uh, Tim Keller's church in, um, in, New York, in, in New York, yeah, Redeemer Presbyterian, which is you know planting like you know seventy churches, PCA churches in in New York, mm-hmm. in, in uh, Manhattan area. So, or you know what, we can have a church that has elves and <laughs> ghosts. <laughs> and... All right. Um, so this is a, a survey that was done in Iceland, um, and uh, so Icelanders seem much more open to phenomena like dreaming of the future, forebodings, ghosts, and elves than other nations. Only 13% of the participants in the study said it's impossible that elves exist. 19% found it unlikely. 37% said elves possibly exist. 17% found their existence likely and 8% definite. 5% right. did not have an opinion on the existence of elves. So I'm not I mean, sh- I'm not sure what this is supposed to say. I mean, okay, it says, says it's not, you know, not going to happen at all. Almost 13, 17, okay, that's within the realm of error. So almost equal numbers say absolutely not, yes. No, eight. only 8% say definite. Uh, okay, 19 said, I don't think so. You know, uh, uh, probably I would wind up in that. I don't know. I guess anything's possible, but it's highly unlikely. You know, and 37 say possibly. What do you mean by possibly? I guess, you know, once again, a lot of things are possible. Uh, however, uh, uh, then there were ghosts. 7% said their existence was impossible. 16% said unlikely. 41% said possible. 18% said likely. And 13% said definite. So you have what uh, twenty? No, thirty-one percent. Almost a third of the people saying 
likely the definite. Yeah. Well, see, and that I see as um, as being something that would be more common. Um, I boy, I've I've met like one person in my life. Um, not that it's something that comes up real often, but somebody that actually believes in elves. Um, as opposed to ghosts, I know a lot of people that believe in ghosts. All right, I don't. I believe in spirits, but I don't believe in ghosts. Um. And, uh, so with all these, uh, all, oh, there's all these TV shows about, you know, sort of ghost hunters and things like that, you know, um, where, where they point to all of these stories, you know, I, and just about everybody I, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that tell stories about this or that, and, um, strange things happening and whatnot. And uh, that they chalk it up to ghosts, and so, so the the ghost numbers didn't really surprise me all that much. Um, but I, uh, for me, it was really the elves thing that kind of struck me as odd. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you're in Iceland. There's a lot of uh, I don't know. Maybe you got a lot of readers of J.R.R. Tolkien there. You know, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I imagine that it's it's more uh if you have people that have these uh that there's a background in um some of the not that iceland is celtic but some of the those sort of older um kind of older uh religions or 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 cultures that were you know, kind of pagan or, or animistic and things, and where you get more of this belief in elves and leprechauns and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's almost, in, in some cultures, it's, it's almost integrated into the culture that, you know, if you, if you ask people um, whether they believe it, they're going to say yes, just because that's, you know, you ask an Irish person, do you believe in leprechauns? Well, of course I do. You know, well, okay, does that mean that they actually sort of keep their eyes open for them? No. But, you know. Right. And my other question, yeah, and this is, you know, if you ask me, I would say definite, just to the heck of it. Though. Just, you know. <laughs> sure, why not, you know. All right, right. All right. Yeah, up to the North Pole, uh, you know. <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't even ha- have a segue into our last story here. <laughs> well, see, now, we were talking about... um about mainline churches and and that would have been a um or and and evangelicals and this is from Al Mohler um who's the president of the Southern Baptist Seminary um but uh all right so we heard a lot um over the past week or so about uh the death penalty um and uh and and a lot of uh, you know, talking about uh, Troy Davis in Georgia, and and just especially because of what, according to the media, according to sort of what we've heard, that there's not much evidence. Um, you know, people, witnesses recanted and and things like that. Um, he even uh, on as you know, as right bef- his last words were basically. Um, saying that he was innocent and asking them to continue to investigate the um, the situation and, and things like that, um, which you know, and and the reality is is that there are um, there are plenty of uh, cases where someone has been executed and they are uh, found out later on. Um, especially recently with all the um, with the advent of DNA testing, uh, where they found out, oh, well, they really didn't do it. Right, or they were on death row and they found out they didn't do it. And on the other hand, what you don't hear about is where the, where the uh, DNA evidence said, oh, yeah, this really was this guy who had claimed to be innocent all along. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, uh, some people say it was real, real weak evidence. Uh, they couldn't convince any one of the nine people on the Supreme Court of it, uh, mm-hmm. any one of them could have, you know, put a stay on his execution, but none of them bought into it. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so, um, 
I, I, you know, full disclosure, um, you know, overall, I am supportive of the death death penalty, um, because I believe it, um, you know, uh, um, you know, there, 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 it, it is a just system. I really, I really come to believe that. Uh, and I've thought through it several times, but I'm not sure I agree with his thing about, uh, it's underlining the importance of every single life. And, and again, I don't know, did he say this or somebody else saying, cause it says, uh, he says in Genesis 9, where capital punishment is mandated for murder. Um, I guess, yeah, I don't like saying it's mandated. It's more like it was permitted because the idea of, in Genesis and in, in Exodus, where it talks about eye for an eye, teeth for tooth, life for life, was that it was really to put a limit on it. Right. That's the maximum. You can't do any more than that. You know, um, contrasting Genesis 9 with Genesis was it 5, where this guy boasts that uh, somebody insulted him, therefore he killed him. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you know for that matter, stuff. the the first murder, all right, Cain killed Abel, right, and God actually put a seal on Cain to protect him from being right. killed. But it was uh, it was in, uh, uh, but actually it was one of Cain's descendants who said this, you know. But again, it's to try to the idea in the Bible is try to, instead of okay, this person was to die, but you weren't to take it out on his kids or his family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, I, as I understand Moeller's point, what he's basically saying is, is look, human life is so valuable that anyone that takes it, um, that that's a really big deal. Um, that, that murder is a really big deal because human life is so valuable. And, um, and, and yeah, he's got a point. I absolutely agree with that point. All right. Now, does that mandate the death penalty? No. Um, yeah, and then I, I, I have to, I don't know, I mean, talk about how fickle we are in terms of our understanding of justice. There are thousands who protested the execution of Troy Davis, and yet um, this white supremacist who dragged James Bird through the dirt and killed him 13 years ago, that wasn't, you know, ignored. they got a lot less attention. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, yeah, but I think a lot of people, even if they are opposed to the death penalty, at the second situation go, you know, well, I, I can understand. I mean, there was no question about his guilt. This guy boasted of what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, the night before he was put to death, he uh, put in this outrageous order for uh, his last meal and then took all the food and threw it on the floor. I mean, he was a, there was, there was no question of his guilt and he was a thoroughly unsympathetic person. Uh, whereas, you know, you know, Troy Davis's supporters said the evidence was shaky. These people recanted and to the very end, I mean, he looked at the family and he said, I didn't do it. You know, he, you know, uh, uh, and that makes for a very sympathetic person. I mean, it's, it's, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're you know, seriously, when, if you're going to be opposed to the death penalty and you're going to highlight one to try to gain sympathy against them, who are you going to pick? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I so, mean, and, you know, I even had a death penalty person one time tell me, you know, you can take, I'll, I'll give you some of the hard ones. Now, I'll, you know, I'll give you some of the hard ones here. But if, if you'll say no to most of the other ones. Yeah, uh, you know, I and I, you know, for me personally, I, I'm kind of on the fence. I've gone back and forth. Um, I, I used to be really against it, um, and, uh, and then I used to be really in favor of it, and now I'm just, I, I have mixed feelings, and the reason that I have mixed feelings is just because I've seen too many situations where, um. And, and by too many, I mean just a couple, but they were people that I knew, um, where I'm convinced that they were innocent. And in this case, it wasn't a death penalty situation, um, but where they went to jail or, or, um, 
you know, had some really significant uh, loss happen to them unjustly, uh, where the courts failed. And, um, you know, and, and, and I, I really, I do believe that we've got the best justice system out there, but it's far from perfect. And, um, and just, and given that, it makes me nervous, um, when, because once you execute somebody, it's, it's too late to say, whoops, we're sorry. You know, it, it's too late to, to say, oh, new evidence, uh, turns out they're innocent after all, let them free. Um, and so, so that just makes me nervous. It's, it's not a theological thing. I, you know, theologically, I have no problem with government, um, using the death penalty when they're certain, um, of, of a person's guilt of, of a person being a murderer. Um, and, uh, I, I'm, you know, the Bible upholds the use of the death penalty, including in the New Testament. It's not just an Old Testament thing. Uh, St. Paul said that the uh, government doesn't use the sword in vain. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's one thing I think we, I, I think we need to, uh, um, differ, uh, uh, um, uh, put a, uh, uh, difference there between, you know, what is mandated and what is permitted in this case. Mm-hmm. There is no question that scripture allows for the death penalty. Does not mean we have to do it. Right. Yeah. That, that's a political question. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's, and it's a question that, you know, in, in our system, every state needs to answer. Mm hmm. Right, and it's a hard question to answer. I don't care what state you're in. I don't care what the situation is. It's a hard question to answer um, because there are going to be some very, you know, easy. There's going to be some extreme situations on both sides, and you're going to be able to pick and say, but you know, this person, you know, do you, you know, should we really be spending the thousands of dollars for this person to sit in jail his whole life when he, you know, deliberately took the life of someone else? Right. You know, and, you know, and and not only paying, not only do we pay him, you know, to sit there, you know, go work out and watch TV. That when he gets, you know, when he if he breaks his leg or something, we have to pay his medical care. Mm-hmm. And when he gets older, there was an issue. I was on, on ABC News uh, well, several years ago. We talked about some of these people who are in life without parole, and you know, now we're now seventy five years old and getting sick, and what the medical bills were. Mm-hmm. Although, from what I've heard. The cost, because of all the appeals and and everything else involved in a, a death penalty case, um, and I, I this is just you know what I've heard, and I've seen the numbers at some point, but I couldn't tell you what they are. It was a long time ago. Um, that it's actually that the death penalty is actually more expensive um, to the taxpayers than life without parole. Um, but I, I, you know, if anybody wants to call me on that, I'm that's not a a position I'm willing to defend. Um, it, it was like I said, it was a while ago that I saw it. But um, I, I, you know, I'm I'm not sure it's necessarily more, but yes, it, it's not cheap. I mean, because mm-hmm. there is an automatic appeal process. Right, right, and the, you, know, you got the appeals. You've got. I mean, there's just a, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I mean, the, where I see it is is the the closure for the family. Um, for the loved ones, and and just um, and 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 I think it's important to send a message. Um, I'm not sure how, how effective it is. Um, you know, if, if somebody's really going to go out and commit murder, that, that, that their mind is, is that sort of messed up, that they're, that twisted, that, that, that that's okay to them. And, you know, how many people are going to, oh, well, I, I live in a state that has the death penalty. So, um, maybe, I, you know, I, I, I question how effective that is. Um, and, uh, so. Yep. But I mean, but as far as for the sake of the family and and for the sake of of just taking the position that human life is very valuable, um, you know, then I I, I understand um, Muller's point about saying that this shows the how much we value human life that someone is going to take it that there's some significant consequences to it. So yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. Death penalty is pro life, but yeah, I understand where he's coming from to a certain extent. Right. So that kind of ends everything for tonight. Um, you know, 
So God watch over and be with you. Greetings to you from New England, where we have the most generous team in baseball. <laughs> they are blowing it in September. So they want to let the Devil Rays get the wild card ahead of them. Um, I think they're playing so bad. I think Kansas City may have a chance at the wild card above uh, the Red Sox now. I'm not sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, all right. Well, uh, so no show next week, right? No show next week. Yep. And, um, so, but we should be back in two weeks. So, um, um, until then, uh, good night, everybody. And God bless. Good night. God bless.